Okay, and today it's the second part of the respiratory physiology, and we start with something called dead space. Okay, we say in our histology and anatomy says we have what? The airways. The airways are con consisting of what? First division is what? Or first generation. It's called what? The trachea. And the trachea is divided into the principal bronchus. Those are division one. This is division zero. And so on. The bronchi divides division two and division three and 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 bronchioli and division 12, 13. Then at 16, we have what? Something called terminal bronchioli that is divided into 17, something called respiratory bronchioli. On the respiratory bronchioli, we have alveoli. Of course, you have 23 divisions. So the respiratory bronchioli also divide into uh, alveolar ducts and ends into alveolar sacs with a lot of alveoli. My question is, from where the gas exchange starts? From what division? So you have to say division 17 or the respiratory bronchioli because it contains what? Alveoli. Okay. The oxygen that comes from up, it cannot make gas exchange into the trachea or bronchi or bronchioli or terminal bronchioli, right? Why? Because its anatomy does not allow this gas exchange. You understand? The hematosis, the diffusion, the function of the lung. So we need the alveoli to do that. So all this part is called what? Anatomic dead space. So what is the anatomic dead space or anatomical dead space? It's the, the, the parts of the airways that does not make gas exchange, does not make hematosis. Is it clear? So from here, the acid start. From here, the parenchyme of the lung start from division 17. Okay, so let's uh, talk about this. The tidal volume, the air that I breathe in and out during, uh, uh, during uh, quiet breathing was called tidal volume. So what was the volume that I breathed in and out during uh, rest breathing? So the answer is five hundred milliliters. Okay. So I breathe in five hundred milliliters. This is the tidal volume. Does all the tidal volume go into the alveoli? No. A part of it will remain into the anatomic dead space. Okay? So what is the ventilation volume? Is it the same as the tidal volume? No. No. So what is the ventilation volume? The ventilation volume is the volume that reach the alveoli and make ventilation. So what do you see here? What is the ventilation volume? 300, 350. 350 milliliters. So what is the anatomical dead space volume? The air that remains into the dead space. 150. 150. Is it clear? Yes. There are a lot of methods the scientists used to determine the volume in the dead space, but I will not explain them now. You have them in your lectures, but it's only an experiment. You understand? Okay, next. 
Now, let's consider we have an alveoli, uh, uh, terminal, terminal uh, bronchioli, and after it, you have alveoli, terminal bronchioli, alveoli, terminal bronchioli, alveoli. Okay, let's consider this one closed. So when I breathe in, the air will go here, here, and here. Here, it will not come to this alveoli. So this alveoli will make gas exchange. No. 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 So I will call it also what? Any space that does not make gas exchange will be called dead space. So what is this will be called also? Dead space. Dead space, but not anatomical dead space. Anatomical dead space means its anatomy does not allow it to do gas exchange, but this one, it can. So what we call it? Alveolar dead space. Is it clear? So this is called the alveolar dead space. Now, there is something else that you have to know, something called the physiological dead space. What is the physiological dead space? It's the anatomical dead space plus the alveolar dead space. Let's consider someone that he breathes in, in all his alveoli. All his alveoli are functioning, uh, are functionally correct. So what is the value of the physiological dead space in that condition? Just the value of the anatomic dead space. Yes. This will be zero. So it will be the same as anatomic dead space. Next. Okay, we say the ventilation volume is 350. So now I will have to talk how much milliliter of air comes into the lung in a minute. So what I have to do, the ventilation volume x, uh, ventilation number per minute. What is the ventilation volume? 350x. How many times I breathe in and out in a minute? Hmm. It's quite different. But the apnea, the normal uh, number of ventilations, is around in books, in books, is around the 12 times per minute. So how much it will give me the rate of the ventilation in one minute, all the ventilation in one minute? Around. 4,200 milliliters, 4, milliliters per minute. So this is the ventilation in a minute, normally. You understand? Of course, if you breathe in 20 times per minute, this will be called tahipnea. Okay, if you breathe under 12, 11, 10, 9 per minute, this is called bradypnea, like, like in cardiology, tachycardia, bradypnea. Cardio. Okay. Okay. Next. 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 Next is something about the compliance. We said that the compliance is how easy I raise what the volume of the lung, right? By raising what? The pressure, what pressure? CPP, the transponential pressure, right? So if I raise one PPP, I have to calculate how much the volume raised. So if the volume, for example, raised 200 milliliter, right? So this, the compliance will be 200 
milliliter per centimeter water because the PKP is in centimeter water, right? Okay, there is two types of compliance. So compliance is delta B on delta PKP. This is the compliance. That's why it's milliliter on centimeter water. Okay, what do you have to know? There are two types of compliance, static versus dynamic. Okay, what is the static compliance? It's the one that we studied it last time. So you have to know what means static compliance. Static compliance means when I increase the PTP, how I increase the PTP, I tell the subject to what? To breathe in some air, to make an inspiration. So the PIP will decrease. So the PTP will increase then i tell him stop the airflow stop breathing so that that's why it's called static static means when there is no airflow so i am calculating the volume when there is no airflow so the air came into the alveoli it made them bigger and after it i tell the the person to stop breathing when he stop breathing the pa becomes the pressure of the atmosphere and becomes zero now i calculate how much volume it increased next i tell him to breathe in a little more air 100 milliliter of air. And the PTP will increase. I tell him, stop your breathing and calculate again the volume. So the, the term of static compliance is to calculate the compliance when the patient stops breathing. Is it clear? So the yes. PA must be zero when I'm calculating the volume. Is it clear? Now let's talk about the dynamic compliance. The dynamic compliance is the compliance, the volume delta V on delta PTP, the modification of the volume when I modify the PTP, the pressure, when I'm breathing. So when I breathe in, when the air comes in, the alveoli become bigger because the PTP becomes bigger. But I'm calculating while breathing. Not, I don't tell the subject to stop breathing, then calculate the volume. You understand? So here the PA is not stable. It's modified. Clear? So, okay, let's try to draw the curve of it. It's the same. Here, what we have here, the pressure, what pressure? And here we have what? The volume. Okay, what is the smallest lung volume you know? Hmm? The residual volume. The residual volume, right? RV. So this is the smallest volume the lung can become. It's called what? RV. What is the medium volume? What is it called? F FRC. Yes, the functional residual capacity. It's the volume that stays in the lung most of the time. Now I have FRC inside my lung, okay? What is the highest level of volume? The total capacity. Yes, the total lung capacity. Okay, when the lung is small, small RB level, 
and I want to make inspiration. You understand what I mean? What should I have to do with the PTP to make inspiration? Yalla. I should increase the PTP, right? So I will increase the PTP like this. What do you accept to see with the, with the volume when you increase the PTP? It increases too. It increases too. But if you look here, it will not increase. What is the meaning of this? It means that it's still too difficult to open the small alveoli even if I increase the pressure, right? Why? Because when the alveoli is very small, you have a very strong what? Surface? Tension. Tension. So when the alveoli is small, you have a very strong surface tension. So until I beat this surface tension, the volume will not increase. So the compliance on the RV is very low. low. After it, the compliance starts to increase. Why? Because I beat, I will beat the surface tension. You understand? And after it, the volume will increase very easy by increasing the PTP. That means that here, the compliance is very good. You understand? And when I almost reach the total lung capacity, the compliance starts to decrease again. Because you cannot expand it more, even if you raise the pressure. Is it clear? So this curve is the curve of inspiration or the curve of expiration? Inspiration. This is the curve of inspiration. Now let's draw the curve of expiration. To make expiration, what do you do? You raise the PIP, right? The intrapleural pressure. So what will happen to the PTP? It will decrease. It will decrease. So if I want to draw the expiration, I will draw it on higher PTPs or lower PTPs? Lower PTPs. Lower PTPs. So, lower. Yes, so I will go like this. This will be the curve of expiration. I will lower the PTP so the volume will become lower, right? Is it clear? <clears throat> now, this is the curve of dynamic compliance during inspiration and expiration, inspiration and expiration. Okay, let me ask you one thing here. If I take a volume, an X here, a fixed volume, X, Okay? And I will ask you, is there a difference of the PTP that makes this certain X volume in inspiration and expiration? Or it's the same PTP, for example, seven or four or eight, that will give me the same volume in inspiration and expiration. Or is there a difference between them? What do you see here? There's a difference. There is a difference. I need more PTP in, in what part? In inspiration or in expiration to reach this volume? Inspiration. In inspiration. That means what? That means it's harder, it's more difficult to expand and then we will lie to a certain volume, then to keep it on that certain volume. You understand? Why? Because you are fighting against the recoil and against the surface tension while you try to reach it. You understand? So that's why you need more PTP 
for a volume. So where is the compliance lower? In inspiration or expiration? In expiration. Compliance is the delta V on delta PPP. Let's fix the volume and fix the PPP. Where is the PTP higher? Inspiration. In inspiration. So how is the compliance in inspiration? Smaller. Lower. Because this is high, not the volume is high. The volume is the same. You understand? So, the compliance in the inspiration is lower than the compliance in expiration. Why? I told you why. Because it's more difficult to make the inspiration to reach a certain volume than keep it from the expiration. This difference between the two compliance curves of inspiration and expiration is called hysteresis. So hysteresis depends on PTP or not? Yes, because it's the difference of PTP from inspiration and expiration. So it's the difference of the compliance from inspiration and expiration. Is it clear? Yeah. Okay, now if someone has fibrosis, someone has what? Fibrosis. Fibrosis. Fibrosis means it has more rigid fibers. So it's more difficult to open. So which curve will modify, the inspiration or expiration? The inspiration. The inspiration. The we will need more... PTP. PTP to expand it. This is during what? Fibrosis. So the compliance is? Lower. So the difference between inspiration and expiration will become? Higher. Higher. So the hysteresis is higher. You understand? So anything that decreases the compliance, what will happen to the hysteresis? Increases. It will increase. And anything that will decrease, that will increase the compliance, for example, an emphysema, what will happen? This one will come near the, the inspiration will be on lower PTP because the compliance is high. So the hysteresis will be low, right? So if the compliance is high, the inspiration curve will be near the expiration curve. So the difference between them will be? Lower. Lower. Okay, if I tell you, low surfactant, low surfactant, what it will do to the hysteresis, increase or decrease? Decrease it. Hmm? It will decrease it. The hysteresis. Low surfactant means high surface tension, means low compliance, means high hysteresis. So I can play with, 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 with like this if I want. Okay, and now let's talk about the, the values of static and dynamic compliance. Static compliance is an increase of 200 milliliter per centimeter water. The dynamic compliance is an increase of 130 milliliter per centimeter water. What is the meaning of this? The meaning of this, if I calculate how much volume is increased, while breathing, I will see that the volume that increased while breathing is lower 
then if I tell the, pay, the uh, subject to what? To stop rating, then calculate how much the volume got bigger. You understand? Let's see why. Why this happened? Why the value of the dynamic component is a little lower than the value of static component? Okay, to understand this, you have to remember where are the alveoli larger in the apex or base? Where is the volume of alveoli more large in the apex or base? Base. In the base. No, you forgot already from last time. We said in the last time, how is the intrapleural pressure in the apex? Guys, gravity. This is the lung and the thorax. So the lung will be traction by gravity downstairs. So the PIP here, how is the PIP here? The pressure here. Low, how is the pressure in the base? Hi. 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 Minus 10 here, minus 2 here. So how is the PTP here? Hi. And how is the PTP here? Low. So how is the volume here? Hi. Because the PTP is the one that makes the volume. And how is the PTP here? And how is the volume here? Low. So what does this mean? The alveoli in the apex are larger than the alveoli in the base. Okay? And now I want to start bracing. This is smaller alveoli in the base. Okay, when I start bracing, so now, before starting bracing, so, which one of this alveoli in the apex or in the base has more air in it? Hmm? The one in the apex. The apex, it has already more air in it than the base. So when I take a brace in, the air that comes, where it will prefer to go? To where it has already air or to where it doesn't have already air? Where it doesn't have air. So it prefers to go to the what? To the base. You understand what I mean? So what will happen to the alveoli of the base? It will increase the volume. Increase the volume. So here I will have a delta V, a difference in volume, right? A big delta V, right? The volume yeah. two minus volume one. Okay, but here, how is the delta V here? Low. Low. So that means the air prefers to go to the base more than to the apex. It's not uniformly distributed, you understand? So that means while I am bracing, I calculated the compliance where the air went, not on the old alveoli, you understand? So we calculate more what? The base than what? The apex. In static compliance, I take a brace in, then I tell the patient to stop bracing, and when he stops, Breathing, all the pressures become equal inside. So the volume will, will increase in all the lung the same, you understand? But while breathing, no, we calculate where the air goes. So that's why we have a little less volume in what? In dynamic compliance than in static compliance. 
I wrote everything here. The static compliance is the compliance of the lung registered when there is no airflow, when PA equals zero. Dynamic compliance is registered while bracing. In orthostatism, the air prefers to go to the base more than the apex. So the base will expand more than the apex. That is already big. So the base has more dynamic compliance than the apex. Is it clear? And you, you read the next. It's exactly the same what I did. The air has not a uniform distribution. Okay, that's why we have the dynamic compliance a little different than the static one. The next subject in the physiology of the respiratory system is the resistance in the air wave. When you take a brace in, the air has a flow, right? This flow of the air will come in the airways and it will face some resistance, right? So as any resistance, the resistance on the airway is the delta P. What is the delta P? From where to where it moves the air? Atmosphere minus alveolar. Alveolar minus atmosphere. P2 minus P1. Alveolar minus atmosphere. So atmosphere is zero. So it will be PA. On what? On the flow. Okay. This is important to know uh, how we say the resistance. The resistance is centimeter water, PA is centimeter water, on, on what? On flow, flow is on what? Letter per second. So this is uh, how we call the resistance on the air wave. But the law that calculates the resistance is the same as in hemodynamics. It's eight multiplied with the viscosity, multiplied with the length, on pi multiplied with what? Radius in fourth level. Is it clear? Okay, which one is, is the most important factor to determine the resistance? radius the radius okay because we, can we modify the length of the airway no how should i do yeah no so i can't become a giraffe increase the length <laughs> decrease the length to increase or decrease the resistance in the airway no what we will learn that will modify the resistance in the airway. The thing that will modify what? The the radius. Radius. So how can you modify the radius? You do bronho dilation or bronho constriction. If you do bronho constriction, what will happen to the resistance? You will decrease the radius. So you will increase the resistance is it clear yeah this is the most important factor okay you will know that most of the resistance you you will face the air will face it is in the upper air passage mean mouth and nose and larynx and in the large airways trachea and bronchus so in the large airway, you have a high resistance. You understand? Why? Because if you go down and down and down and down, what will happen to the resistance? The air comes here and it divides into, into two places. So when you calculate the total resistance in that cross section, it will be a lot lower exactly on like on the blood vessel you do not calculate this plus this plus this plus this plus this plus this no you calculate one on this plus one on r2 plus one on r3 because it is divided 
this way. You understand? This is a principle of resistance in all the resistance. So here, how is the cross section in the small airway? Very, very high. So the resistance will be very, very low. Low. So uh, they say in your lecture that the cross section in the small airways are 2,000 times more than cross section in the large airway. So the resistance is a lot more. They say that it's 10% of the resistance in the low, in the small peripheral airway. Is it clear? Next. Now let's talk about the lung volume. You know lung volume? The lung volume means the volume of the alveoli. You understand? If I have here an alveoli and some airways, alveoli and airways, airways and alveoli. Okay, this alveoli, it has recoil or not? Yes. Yes. What the recoil of this alveoli will try to do to this alveoli? It's a tendency to? Contract. Contract. Collapse. To go back to its initial form. You remember this or not, Eric? Yes. Okay, what the recoil of this uh, alveoli will try to do? Try to? Collapse. Collapse. And for this one? The same. The same. Okay. Now, when the recoil is stronger, when the alveoli is bigger or smaller? When it's bigger. When it's bigger, the recoil will be stronger, right? Okay, now what you have to, to study that this recoil is bound on what? On the airways of the next alveoli. You understand? So this recoil, what is it doing? It's trying to collapse this alveoli, but in the same time, what it do to the airways? Dilate them. Dilate them. Open it. Expand them. So when you have a good recoil, the airways are open or more open. So the resistance is? Lower. Lower. So when the lung volume is high, the recoil is? Higher. High. So the radius is? High, so the resistance is low. Oh. So the volume of the lung change uh, on opposite direction with the resistance in the airway. So if you increase the volume of the lung, you actually decrease the resistance in the airway. Is it clear? Inverse yeah. proportional. Okay, now, do you know a pathology where the recoil is destroyed, the fibers are destroyed? Emphysema. Emphysema. I have no more fibers. What will happen to the lung volume? It will decrease. No, the fibers grow. It's the recoil that it will try to decrease, right? So if you don't have fibers, you don't have recoil. So the volume also will be high. Volume will be high. Okay, the volume is high, but no recoil. So I I have no something called radial traction. You understand? The radial traction 
was opening my airways. Now, an emphysema, the volume of the lung is big, but no radial traction. So the airways are small, so the resistance is, wow. High, because it's narrowing the airway. Do you understand or not? But why, like why does it become smaller? It's smaller. Why? Because when we had the recoil, the recoil was tractioning the airways. Do you understand? Yeah. And make the resistance slow. Now I have no recoil to traction the airway. So the airways will become? Like does the other alveoli pushes against the airway from like the yes. other all next oh, arm? Okay. Yes, because uh, the recoil is connected to the airways. Like I said, do you understand? Yeah. So the recoil is trying to open the airway. But when you have no recoil, the airways will become small. Smaller. You understand? Now I have to define two pathologies. Something called restriction and something called obstruction. When I'm talking about obstruction, I, you have to understand that it's narrow airway. You understand? But restriction means a small lung. So the emphysema is obstruction or restriction? Obstruction. Obstruction, because it didn't make the lung small. It didn't make, you understand what I mean? It makes yes. the airways small. Even it, it affects, the affection is in the alveoli, but the effect is what? Obstruction. Is it clear? Okay. Now, we said, so now when we said in inspiration, the volume will increase, so the recoil will increase, so the resistance will Decrease. Decrease. You have to know also the PIP. The PIP can affect the airways. You, you know? In inspiration, what we will do to the PIP? Decrease. So it will not press on the airways. So the transmural pressure of the airways will, Decrease. will increase because any transmural equal inside minus outside. And outside, what is outside always? The PIP. If the PIP is decreased, the transmural will increase. So the volume of the alveoli, uh, of the airways will also what? Increase. So the resistance in the, alve in the airways will decrease. Okay. What you have here, here you have a bronchitis. Bronchitis is an inflammation of the bronchies, okay? It's obstruction or restriction? Obstruction. Obstruction. And the emphysema makes the lung big or small? Big. Big, but it affects the airways and makes them Never. Small. If you have bronchitis and emphysema, this is called COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. You understand? This is the uh, this is happening by smoking. Smoking is the most important factor that makes COPD. What do you think? Where do you think the obstruction will happen? In the small airways or larger airways? The small ones? In the small airways. In COPD, the resistance in the small airways will become more than the resistance in the 
Large ones. Large airways. Good. The large airways are rigid and have cartilage. And it's difficult to obstruct them. You understand? Okay. Now, next. Autonomic nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Do you remember what the sympathetic do to the airways, to the bronchus, when you run? Hmm? Dilate them. Bronchodilation. So what the sympathetic do to the resistance in the airway? Decrease. Decrease. Decrease the resistance. Parasympathetic. Increasing. Increasing the resistance. And this is it. Sympathetic release, epinephrine and norepinephrine. But the receptor on the airways, on the bronchial eye, are beta 2. So which one of them affects better the beta 2? The adrenaline is a stronger agonist for beta 2. So it will decrease the resistance. The parasympathetic release what? Acetylcholine. What is the receptor on the bronchial eye of acetylcholine? It's called muscarinic tree. So this one will do a bronchoconstriction and increase the resistance. Is it clear? Yes. Okay, what if I ask you, what does the beta agonist do to the bronchial eye? What it do to the resistance? Beta agonist, I said. Beta agonist means activates beta. Where do you have beta? Here or here? Here. Pathetic, yeah. So what it will do to the resistance? Decreases it. You understand? What if you give someone beta blocker? What it will do? Bronco? Constriction. You understand? Yeah. Okay. What if you give someone anticholinergic? What is the meaning of anticholinergic? It's something against the acetylcholine. Anticholinergic. What it will do to the resistance? Decreases it. What? Decreases it. Decreases it. Because the anticholinergic will do broncho. Dilation. Dilation. So if someone has an obstruction, an obstructive disease, you understand what I mean? He has an obst obstructive disease, like COPD, for example, chronic obstructing disease, pulmonary disease. The treatments we give them are what? Beta-2 agony and anticholinergic. You understand? So this is the, the principle of the treatment of that pathology. What do you have also to know? You know that this is a phospholipid and there is an enzyme called phospholipase A2 that cuts the second fatty acid of the phospholipid and releases something called what? Arachidonic acid that is transformed by the cyclooxygenase and the lipooxygenase into this four thing thromboxane prostaglandin prostaglandin leukotriene those initiate something called inflammation increased mucus bronchoconstriction what is a factor that can activate inflammation in the airways <coughs> The smoking. The smoking can activate the inflammation in the airways and do all this process that narrows the airways. You understand? So that's why some drugs like the cortisone that can inhibit the phospholipase A2 and decrease the inflammation can be beneficial in that pathology. You understand? Especially in an asthma. It's an inflammation also there. You understand? If they ask you which one of those is the strongest bronchoconstrictor, you have to say what? 
leukotrienz. Okay? You have to say what? Leukotrienz. So, you, we also have the histamine. Histamine also do bronchoconstriction, but not so strong as the leukotriene. So you have to know who makes bronchoconstriction and who makes bronchodilation. Is it clear? Okay, I'm not talking more about this. This, we talked about it. If you have a large lung volume, you will have a, a strong recoil, so strong radial traction. So the airway radius will increase. So the airway resistance will decrease. But in emphysema, we have large volume, but no recoil. So no radial traction. So the radius of the airway will be low. So the resistance will be high. 